welcome back to iGen Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Shee. I'm currently a sophomore at UCLA, was elected as the youngest delegate for Joe Biden, and co-hosts this podcast. And I'm Jill Weinbanks, his co-host and the author of The Watergate Girl, and um, also the wearer of hashtag Jill's Pins. And today's pin is a American Eagle holding some arrows, and I, it is sending strength and military support to Ukraine. And because our guest today has uh, made commentary on Ukraine, we'll be talking to her about that, as well as many other issues. Last week, Miles Taylor joined Jill and me for a fascinating conversation on his decision to speak out against former President Trump as anonymous while still serving in the Trump administration, and why it's now his mission to prevent extreme Republicans and Trump from running for office in 2024. Today, we're joined by another Trump administration member with a similar mission, Olivia Troy. Olivia Troy worked on national security and homeland security issues at the National Counterterrorism Center, the United States Department of Energy Office of Intelligence and Counterintelligence and the Department of Homeland Security Office of Intelligence and Analysis. Olivia then served as a Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor for Vice President Mike Pence and as a member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force until she left her position in summer of 2020. Since then, Olivia has been an outspoken critic of Donald Trump and endorsed Joe Biden for president. And currently, she's the chief strategy officer for the Renew America movement, which is actively working to elect better Republicans to office and prevent Trump from gaining more power in 2024, as well as vice president of strategy, policy, and plans at the National Insurance Crime Bureau. You'll get to know Olivia in this episode today. We're going to talk about her very impressive career her background and how she got into that career, uh, why it's imperative to prevent Trump and other extreme right-wing Republicans from being elected, how to restore unity in this country, and her latest revelation about suffering from the Havana syndrome. It's going to be a packed episode. So Olivia, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. We are too. So let's maybe start with your career. Um, for the majority of your professional life, you've worked in national security. I'm wondering first, what prepared you for that career? And give our audience perhaps a picture of what that means. That is, you know, when you get to your desk in the morning, what exactly did you do? Well, first, I've always been interested in international relations and politics, to be honest. Since I, I was at a very young age, I was very politically active and in high school and growing up, I was very politically active in college, too. I went to the University of Pennsylvania and, and started my career early on in politics. And, uh, you know, my career has taken me all over the world from, you know, Iraq to Afghanistan to other places in the Middle East. That's where I mostly focused my career. Um, started in the Pentagon and then onward to um, the more focused on the homeland and then to the White House during a very trying time. <laughs> we have to have you say, you mentioned the Pentagon, and as the former general counsel of the Army, I have to know more about where you started in the Pentagon. <laughs> so coincidentally, um, my very first job there, I was a Schedule C at the time, so I was a political appointee, yeah. but I started uh, where you worked, Jill, ah. which is in the Army General Counsel's office. That was my first, that was my very first, first job in government, officially. Wow, and what did you do there? So I was what they call a confidential assistant. I don't know if that's what they called the younger political still back in the day. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I was a very young staffer. Um, yeah. I handled all the scheduling and just special projects. Uh, but, you know, it was an interesting place to be because that was at yeah. the start of all of the Afghanistan mm -hmm. operations mm -hmm. early on. I mean, we're talking right after 9-11 is when I got to the Pentagon. That's wow. why I chose to go there was because I wanted to really focus on more national security issues uh, after working at the RNC at the very beginning. Fascinating. It's The Pentagon is just one of the best places to work and to understand how much uh, defense and state work together, how much international matters at the Pentagon, which you don't always think about, um, and how good the military is in terms of training the civilians who come in as Schedule Cs, yes, um, and um, and just how good they are in terms of all the policy and strategies. Yes, absolutely. And look, I, I'm really grateful, actually, that I started my career there uh, because I got to work alongside some of great military officers. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. 
enlisted and civilians there. Uh, the Pentagon is kind of its own world in that building. <laughs> it's like a mini city. Um, so, you know, I definitely got lost a lot at the beginning. I can find my way around. That's typical for the Pentagon. Um, but I was really grateful that um, I've had some mentors um, from back in the day then that have remained uh, mentors to yes. me. Uh, throughout my career. And, you know, I spent a few years there. I, I worked there and then I worked in the policy office uh, for the undersecretary for policy in the Pentagon. Yeah. And that's how I went to Baghdad. I worked for Ambassador Bremer. I was, again, a young staffer back in 2003 uh, and then sort of proceeded my career from there until I joined the career service and joined the Intel uh, community yeah. and uh, proceeded to the National Counterterrorism Center. But like I, I did my graduate work Alongside with the military, I went to the National Defense University, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School. So I really, I just have so, such a strong affiliation uh, to the military because that's really kind of, I, I tell people that's where I grew up, even though as a civilian, yeah, yeah. but that's the community that I was surrounded with uh, from, very, from very early on in my career. That's amazing. And, you know, you started at the Pentagon, you ended up in the Trump administration. To me, it seems like there was no straight line from that to where you ended up. Is that true? Because one of the things that we notice with our guests when we talk about careers is that there is no straight line. Many of the instances, was that the case for you as well? Yeah, you know, I think even though I was politically active, I'll say this. Uh, I started at Penn as a pre-med student. So I, I thought oh, I was wow. going to be a heart surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I realized that I'm, I'm, I'm just too... Um, my, I'm just too giving and attached to people. And so I just decided that I did not have uh, what it would take in yeah, case I, yeah. if I lost a, a patient. I didn't think I would ever be able to be that person uh, that comes out and tells a family wow. that. And yeah. uh, so I pivoted. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a graduate with a degree in political science and theater, which I like to say is very complimentary, especially these days, because <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of theatrics and politics. And so here I am. Um, but yeah, certainly. Uh, I just, you know, I was a big believer that you kind of rise to the challenge and doors open along the way. And I certainly did not have this planned in any linear fashion. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when I chose to go to the Department of Homeland Security, I actually got there the week before Trump got elected. Hmm. So I thought I was going to be working on really countering domestic terrorism issues, really focused on homeland after working on, you know, critical infrastructure resilience and, and cybersecurity. And so I really wanted to work on domestic things and countering rising violence, countering uh, white supremacy, anti-Semitism. But obviously, I the timing is, is just incredible because I get there and I end up working on executive orders that are counter to anything that I ever thought I would be signing up for, to be honest. So Olivia, you and I now have, uh, I'm seeing like we're really related somehow because <laughs> I started college as an occupational therapy major, realized I needed a different career path when I learned my second year I would have to cut up a cadaver and didn't think I could yeah. do that. Nope. Um, and like you, I just sort of, my career has bounced around because opportunities presented themselves and I thought, well, that would be interesting. And... Uh, I think I hope that our listeners are getting that message that you really have to think about how do you reevaluate what you're doing and emphasize the things you love and get rid of the things you don't love and move to a different career path. Uh, when I was offered the job in the Pentagon, I also had offers for the White House and the Department of Justice where I would have, you know, known what I was doing, whereas the Pentagon I wouldn't have recognized a general on my first day. I mean, I had to sort of study up on what are the insignias on the shoulders and how do you know who's who. Um, so I did anyway. the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, we are related. There's no question. I was so terrified that there was going to be a general or a thief or an admiral walking in and I was going to call him the wrong thing. And I, I was like, and this is how I get fired. And it's like, I'm <laughs> very early in my 20s, and I was like, this is not the best way to start off my career. Exactly. I'm just going to humiliate myself. So I remember <laughs> my boss at the time comes out, and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, uh, did you know that different services get called different ranks, like lieutenant, colonel, or thick? I mean, it was just really funny. And he's looking at me, just shaking his head. And I was like, maybe you should study that too, because I'm not sure you know either. So. <laughs> 
Excellent. Oh my gosh. Okay. For sure, for sure. Well, so you started, like you said, you started your federal service under the George W. Bush administration, who seems quite different fr- than uh, former President Trump in terms of character and policy. How did your time in the Trump administration differ from your time in the Bush administration? Oh, like night and day. <laughs> I mean, it's just a different character and type of persona. Mm-hmm. You know, I, um, I got to know uh, President Bush and, and Laura Bush and Whenever I interacted with them, they were very kind. You know, Laura Bush had spent time actually, um, some time. I mean, they're from Texas. I'm from Texas. They'd spent time. She'd been uh, to my hometown of El Paso. Uh, they were very embracing of different different cultures, is what I'll say. So, with a different time, especially because I'm half Mexican, I'm Mexican American. My mom is from oh. Mexico. She's a Mexican immigrant. Um, it was it was like. Living in an alternate universe, I will say, yeah. working in the Trump administration. And I'll say this. I have worked around a lot of different administrations in my government career. And, you know, I try to be diplomatic about this when I say it. Um, I never saw the type of vitriol and sort of behavior and disrespect mm-hmm. amongst the politicals that I worked with. You know, if, as a career intel officer or civil servant, I, you know, I, I was in the Bush administration, then I became career. I was around the Obama administration. I'm, I was fortunate to meet President Obama along the way. And I never saw a demeanor like that, like the demeanor wow. that I saw from a lot of the Trump appointees, um, especially from his inner circle. It's just uh, the lack of decorum and respect for for civility, I will say, and respect for yeah. our government service and intelligence community and, and military as well was just absent. Um, Mm. It was just a very different environment from day one, from literally, I'll remember the day of the inauguration and the very next day, things were very different at DHS. Can you Um, tell us how? Can you describe that? Yeah. You know, um, (laughs) we had done all the preparation and I only mention this because it's such a contrast to what we saw in the terms of the presidential transition between and you know, President President uh, Trump and, and Biden, because we we did all that transition and prep for uh, the incoming Trump administration. We prepped all the binders. We did all the prep briefings. Uh, you know, that's what we do is we want to make sure that we're ensuring continuity of government and that they can hit the ground running. It was chaos from day one. It was hmm. there was the travel restrictions executive order that was issued, which was a travel ban. Uh, you know, I'll never forget when yeah. we were told as government people, I think it was three days into the administration, they locked us into a room and said, don't come out until you have a list of countries. And I'll say they didn't lock us, but they said, you know, don't come out oh. until you have a list of countries ready to go. And wow. Uh, and I'll I'll never forget. I went back to my office and I remember getting Oreo. Like, I think I got Girl Scout cookies because that was the <laughs> only thing I had to offer people. After being in that conference room in a secure facility with all these television screens that were so hot, and there were a group of us, about eight people that were across policy, across DHS, across the intel community at DHS, just staring at each other going, "What? how are we going to navigate this? And how do we do this in the best possible way where we also don't destroy our national security apparatus? in the process and destroy our international relationships. And that pretty much summarizes how it kicked off. I mean, this is, this happens over a course of eight hours, by the way, Wow. where my husband gets a phone call from me that says, I'm not, I don't know when I'm coming home tonight. I'll explain this to you later. And then three hours later, I call him and it's 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, we're still here. It's going to be a long night. Um, You know, and he had no idea. And the next thing, the chaos hits, you know, we got blindsided. Um, I know that Secretary Kelly at the time got blindsided, and that's why you see the chaos at the airports with people trying to figure out what's going on. And Mm -hmm. um, I remember just watching that play out, being on the inside, just trying to process everything that was happening. And that happened repeatedly. It happened. They issued several executive orders sort of in the immigration space. And I almost think, I mean, Stephen Miller is a very calculated individual, and I think they did it purposely because they knew that it would break the system because it is, let me just say that it's the same people 
that are working a lot of this at a very senior level, especially in the immigration kind of sphere or anything that relates to that to screening and vetting in the in the homeland security community. It's the same people at state, same people at DOJ, DOD. And so uh, you know, there's there was a method to their madness, I guess, but it was certainly chaotic on the receiving end for those of us that had to work on this. And yet it had to have been completely predictable. I mean, you mentioned that you have a Mexican uh, mother and you had at the announcement of Trump running for office, um, his horrendous statements about Mexican criminals. And you certainly had warnings from everything during the campaign, it helps me to understand that you were career by that point, that you were no longer a Schedule C. Um, but even still, um, you must have thought about quitting, that I can't serve this administration, and then weighing it against, well, but if I stay, maybe I can stop some of the worst. Was that going through your mind? I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, when the administration first came into office, uh, so I I rarely get sick. I, I never call in sick to work. I will say that I showed up every single day hmm. because I was scared of what was going to happen if I didn't show up <sighs> that morning or a meeting or I skipped it. And it sounds absolutely ridiculous because you know that one person can't do it all. And I, I think in this <laughs> scenario, I was really grateful for the people in that room who were trying to figure out how to navigate this collectively. Uh, and look, I, I, I think Miles Taylor appeared on your podcast. That's yes. how Miles and I met. Yeah, uh, We did not know each other prior to the Trump administration, but we met in the chaos mm -hmm. of that. And I will say, and Miles, Miles Taylor knows this, we were shocked when Miles Taylor walked in and we're, you know, we're, there's three of us and we're all gathered around this computer and we're still working this. And I remember that my assistant still remembers this today. Miles walks in and looks at us and he's like, how long have you guys been here? And we look, you know, destroyed. We're, we're just exhausted and we've been working on this for months. And he's like, when was the last time you all ate? Oh, and we're wow. just like, you know, and, and, and Miles is on the political side of the house. Right. Yeah. And so I only say that because we're all kind of like, where's he, what angle is he coming at us from? Right. right. And it was apparent that he was just, he was aware of what we were up against, yeah. especially uh, from his from his optics and his his offense, and so I just remember that he bought he brought us pizza, and we were all shocked oh. because we were like, "Why is he nice? Like, what's he <laughs> <ending> here?" <laughs> so you also Terrible. you also worked with another of our guests. Um, so this is sort of interesting. You at you mentioned this already that um, you worked with Chris Miller, uh, who became the acting Secretary of Defense in the last days of the Trump administration, including on January 6th. But you worked with him when he was head of the National Counterterrorism Center. And so I don't know if you've seen our interview with him. Um, it's, a, you should, and this is one you should watch on YouTube because we do this YouTube and as a podcast. Um, it's one that you can't fully capture his responses without seeing his body language. So I would suggest go on YouTube and please watch Chris imagine. Miller. But <laughs> but I would love to hear some of your comments of what you knew of him when he was in a job that maybe was within his area of expertise as opposed to being Secretary of Defense. Yeah, you know, actually, I knew Chris Miller in the White House. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew him at the National Security Council because he was the director for counterterrorism. So uh, the senior director. So we worked on a lot of issues. Uh, uh, he was there. Um, he knows that it was a very challenging environment, I will say. You know, I, Chris, Chris and I got along when we were working during that time. Um, I specifically will remember a conversation with Chris Miller about the rise of domestic terrorism and my concern about the rise of these mass shootings that were happening in terms yeah. of the attacks we were seeing on synagogues. And the mass shooting that happened in El Paso. Now, as you can imagine, yes. I grew up there. Right. Um, I was, I worked on all of these mass shootings in the aftermath of them because I was a homeland advisor. So it was part of my job was to track these events immediately as they were developing or in the aftermath and really understand what was happening and do the follow up and engage with the national security community. On that, and I can't tell you what it's like to be sitting in the white or, or sitting. Actually, I think I was at a beer festival when I got the word 
on my own social media about the mass shooting in El Paso. Wow. And I had just taken one sip and I remember my husband said I went pale. I found out about it from Facebook, by the way, from one of my friends uh-huh. posting that they were, at, they were at the mall right near it. And uh-huh. I remember handing the beer to my husband and I looked pale and he was like, what happened now? Like he, he was so used uh-huh. to something really bad always happening at all hours because this is what it was like. And I said, I've got to go. And um, I remember this because I show up to work, by the way, and I'm like in a sundress, like outfit, <laughs> totally casual. And I didn't even stop to think about the fact that I was probably not dressed appropriately for going to work. <laughs> I mean, it was an inappropriate, but you know, right. I didn't have like a suit on or a jacket. Right. I literally just got in the car and started driving because I just knew after working so many, you know, when it's going to be bad. And I could tell mm-hmm. that it was going to be bad. Oh. What I didn't know was that my aunt was in the Walmart. Oh. Um, and that was really, that was really hard. And I remember having the conversation with Chris Miller that day. Um, and I said, we have a really serious problem here. You and I both know that it's not acknowledged in the way that we need to be working on this. And, and that was really hard. <laughs> you know, and Chris, Chris, he's kind of, you know, He's a, can be a quirky personality sometimes. And he always has a sense of humor, which is good, I think, in this role. But what he said to me was like, you know, he's focused on the CT side of the house. And that's why I think this makes it so hard for domestic terrorism and incidents like that, because they really sometimes in the White House don't really have a home for who works the policy and national right. security. And he said to me, you know, if you, I know you really care about this. So, you know, maybe you should ask to see your boss, you know, maybe you can run the office on this or something. And <laughs> I I mean, I had to kind of, I almost laughed because I'm looking at him. We're both looking at each other like, we both know the answer to that. <laughs> you know. Mm. And as I walked into the West Wing to go brief on it, and I remember talking to my aunt and being like, are you okay? And she was the one that described the shooter to me. And in her description, that's when I knew and we saw the manifesto about the Hispanic invasion of Texas. Yes. And yeah. I'll say this, um, I could not believe the audacity of someone in the Trump administration looked at me and said, well, I mean, I guess the good thing is he was he was targeting Mexicans, <gasps> so he wasn't actually targeting your aunt. And I oh was speechless, God. and I was like, <sighs> "Well, she's Mexican, I'm Mexican." <gasps> and then I said, "You know, actually, that doesn't even matter. It was the fact that this person killed anyone, <laughs> right?" But oh. yes, with the subtext of. We all know what this is. Let's not shy away from it. Um, and I think that that is just sort of the tone that remained, as you saw. Wow. That is one of the most dramatic things I've ever heard. That is, boy, that really says who the Trump administration was. Um, and, okay, so while you were involved in national security for the Trump administration, you also had a completely different role as an aide to the White House Coronavirus Task Force. And I I have scratched my head. You've established your bona fides for national security, but how did that assignment come about and what is your background that enabled you to take on that assignment? Sure. Yeah, I know. It seems kind of like what, how did, how was that set up in the national security office? And the truth is, um, on the vice president's side of the house, the national security team is very small. So we are divided by uh, regions. I, I mean, every administration may do it differently. But for the most part, there are career detail leads that work there in that office. And it's divided by regions. And then it's divided in this, this office, we were divided by function. I was a functional person. So basically, I was the one that tracked emerging threats. I tracked domestic emerging oh, okay. threats and then global terrorism events. So what happened is that I was working closely with the regional person that was tracking what was going on and what was going on in China. Um, I was working with the WMD guy and others. Uh, but really when it pivoted, I was looking at it. I, I was always looking at things from the lens of like, how do we protect the American people and what does this mean for us? Because that was my role right. in this. And so I was going to the task force meetings from day one. Uh, before Mike Pence even was running the task force at the time, because I was tracking it for him from a more broader picture of what it, what does this mean for us? Uh, what does this mean for the American people? Where is this where is this potential threat going in terms of what we were seeing here? And so 
that, and, and by that point, to be honest, I had been working for Mike Pence for two years at that point, about two years. And so there was a comfort level as well um, with him. He's, he's very guarded. He keeps his, his circle very tight and hit and close. And, um, and so I, I had worked very closely with General Kellogg as well. And so mm-hmm. I was one of the more longer term people on the team. And I think that's kind of how it pivots. And because I had been tracking this as a threat from day one, fast forward to the end of February, when Mike Pence is voluntold, you're going to run this thing. I end up front and center completely again. I, I have a knack, by the way, for taking jobs where I show up and everything's calm and then everything goes boom and I'm in the middle of whatever <laughs> happened. So I don't know what that says about me per se and the jobs and the roles that I take. Hopefully it's not an ongoing trend. Um, but he gets handed the task force and I end up you know, in, in the middle of yeah. it as a coordinator working with Dr. Mm-hmm. Fauci and then Dr. Brooks, who uh, gets tapped as he's taking over the task force uh, to work on it. Well, that actually now makes complete sense and is interesting from a career resume standpoint. And again, it's sort of that lesson for our listeners about how you pivot into other roles and then can use them. Um, But let me ask you one other question about this, uh, maybe last question on this subject, um, which is you haven't been shy about criticizing the former administration's handling of the pandemic. And so if you could maybe give some brief comments on what went wrong and what could have been done better and just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, I think what was so frustrating for many of us who were in this situation was the fact that you had a group of people for the most part who were really trying to work hard and figure out what we were going to do in this scenario. Right. And I'm talking about, uh, the doctors on the task force, the interagency, um, the National Security Council, including Matt Pottinger, we were all trying to figure out what was happening in China, how we could get transparency, how we could figure out ground truth of what was happening and what that was meaning for here. And I'll say as these meetings geared up, the one thing we never planned for was to have the person at the very top undermining our efforts consistently, either by his random comments or rhetoric, rhetoric or divisiveness. I mean, we, you know, we ended up being so divided on things such as like the mask, right? All because of his comments where that could have changed everything. We should have been united as Americans sort of facing this virus together. And I think that's still, that still somewhat remains today, right? I mean, we're still seeing the impacts and effects of what happened there early on. And so Mm -hmm. I think when you, when you come out, there's a certain sense of gaining and maintaining the public trust. And I think in this scenario, there were so many factions, even internally in the white house. And look, there were their COVID deniers that I had to work with, even within my own office that were coughing on me and then turning (gasps) up positive for COVID the next day. And I was like, How can you do that when we work for the vice president of the United States? Our priorities should be making sure that the leadership of the country is safe so we we can Mm -hmm. continue to function as a U.S. government as we face this, you know, invisible virus enemy head on and try to protect the American people while we're at it. Um, But that is the level of sort of the dynamics that we were facing internally. And I can't tell you how angry it was to see them attack people like Dr. Fauci, yeah. even people inside the white house who really are just public servants. And by that yeah. point, I'll say just watching this, it was okay. So <laughs> this administration has attract attacked the media. He, he, they've, they, they've become fake news, right? That's what they call them. Right. They've undermined the media media. They've undermined the intelligence community especially when they say that Russia, you know, was potentially interfering in our elections or they were telling the truth about things and relationships that really should not be. Uh, And so it just pivots and then they pivot and they undermine the public health community uh, in a way that I think we, we still haven't bounced back from. And so it just seems that wherever, instead of being united and coming together and leading in the middle of a crisis or leading against an adversary it was always just a battle internally to protect and keep Americans safe. And it shouldn't really be that way. 
uh, right? And so and towards the end, some of the comments, um, Trump, you know, he really is someone that really solely cares about himself. And when you're in a situation like this, it's very hard because even for Mike Pence, I'll say this, we didn't know. We had no idea once we left that task force meeting what the heck was going to happen in the press conference that we were about to walk into. Wow. And that's how you end up with the bleach incident and the sunlight and, you know, um, and it, it was just every single day. Yeah. It, it must have been a terrifying time because, and as you point out, the effects of that have not gone away because you have millions of Americans who still believe the false statements that came out of that time. Um, but, uh, Victor, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that you went into work every single day, and in July or August of 2020, you resigned. I'm wondering why that was. Was there a tipping point for you? Yeah, there were a lot of tough issues uh, along the way uh, working around the administration and the administration. I think there were so many moments where you definitely just want to be like, I'm just done. I can't do this anymore and quit. I think for me, one of the, I mean, there were so many incidents, right? Like I've told you about the El Paso thing. Yeah. Certainly there were times during um, the executive orders that were issued, um, especially because I also had the refugee portfolio um, that was hard. Uh, but I'll, I'll say it was uh, that moment at Lafayette Square I was in the White House when that happened, and um, I had just left when Trump decided to go on his, what I call, a wannabe dictator parade around Lafayette Square and his pomp and circumstance after having cleared out the square. And I had just been walking around Lafayette Square right before because I felt like this was a big moment for our country, and I wanted to see people, their voices wanted to be heard, and I saw peaceful protesters. That's what I saw that day. I was on the White House grounds and I walked out and I said, I, I want to get out. And, you know, I saw moms and I saw children. I saw people on their knees. I saw journalists covering what was happening. What I didn't expect was to go back into work and be told that I needed to leave my desk immediately. And, you know, sort of, I'm sitting there thinking, I have all this work to do on COVID still. I, I have got to track threats. I've got to track domestic incidents. and. I don't, I can't leave right now. Um, but we were evacuated and, and told, and as I'm walking away, I can see sort of all of these tr kind of, uh, officers and troops moving in. And so I get home and I'll never forget when I turn it on and I see Bill Barr walking around and I was like, I knew, I just, I've, I've, I've worked with these people. I've seen them firsthand. And I was like, something's not right. Mm -hmm. Something really bad is about to happen. I don't know what's about to happen, but I know something's not right. And then sure enough, I see the clearing. Um, I saw, you know, this actually I saw the uh, stable news camera that I had seen on my walk out there. And I see that camera and I see the horses and I see the police kind of move in and all that happens, get knocked over. And I just remember thinking about this mother and daughter sitting there. And I remember thinking, what happened to them? And to have that contrasted. And then I waited, right? I wait like probably most Americans. Trump gets up there with that Bible in front of that historic church. And I waited for him to say something, anything, anything that would be somewhat what a leader of our country should say. And instead it was pomp and circumstance and just sitting there holding a prop with nothing. And I, I do remember that I walked into someone very senior in the vice president's office. And I said, tell me why I shouldn't quit the very next morning. Tell me why I shouldn't quit. And this person was someone, um, someone who was a very uh, devout person of faith. And I said, because you can't tell me that you're okay with what we all just saw happen last night. And I, you know, I remember thinking about that because I had been in the previous meetings that week where Trump was basically directing governors and directing people in those meetings saying, you've got to mow these people down. You've got to show force. This is law and order. And it was a calculated narrative that they had established to bring fear to communities because it, he thought it would play well to his election. And he wanted to be that forceful, tyrannical person. And so in watching those meetings and watching this play out on, you know, the white house parameter, 
I was like, this guy, there, there are no red lines. There's no bottom every day. It just gets worse and worse. And this guy, and I remember having that conversation, by the way, back then with someone in that staff and saying, what happens if he doesn't leave? If he loses. Wow. Which makes me terrified of the thought of even, you know, if he runs for office again, if he wins, that's just, that just cannot happen. Um, I'm wondering how many of your colleagues who didn't resign before the inauguration of President Biden do you think felt the same way? And why don't you think they resigned? Yeah, you know, I, it was, <laughs> my dog has feelings, strong feelings about this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> it's it's usually my this. dog who does that, but. He's, he's laying here quietly. Name. We've trained him to bark. <laughs> 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 uh, no, like I think, uh, you know, I think it's a mix. I think um, I, I can't tell you. I, I mean, we had a lot of conversations, even internally in the White House, where people knew um, how dangerous, uh, how dangerous Trump is as a personality. And when he is, I think a lot of people did hang in there because uh, I think many people thought, you know, who comes after me? And we saw a lot of that, and yeah. especially in 2020, um, you know, with certain people be put in certain spots, we saw basically loyalists be installed. Yeah. And so every person, when they would clear someone out um, from their role or whatever, especially on the national security side of the house, they were re- really looking for nothing but loyalists, regardless of competence. And I can tell you that firsthand because I had conversations with a cabinet person who said, I can't even staff certain functions that are important because they won't clear anyone that I try to hire. It has to be wow. a loyalist that has to do this. And I'm, my hands are tied. And that is, that's a pretty dangerous scenario because I also think that that's how you end up hurting a lot of the U S government. And that's how you end up in scenarios like January 6th, where you watch sort of a yeah. national security apparatus kind of, fail in many ways for that scenario, right? You see a polar opposite to what you see in the response that summer to what you see on January 6th. And so I think there were a lot of people who hung in there. And then of course, the palace intrigue is real. That's what I tell people. Power (laughs) ambition is all real. And so I think working with a lot of people, I saw a lot of people that started off being a completely different person, um, maybe a good person, I would say, And I saw the transformation of a lot of these individuals firsthand where, uh, you know, I think that their quest to gain power and remain in that powerful sphere, regardless of who it was and how dangerous it was, uh, they were going to follow because this was their shot. And I guess that's the difference between, you know, some of the people that chose to leave and some of the people that chose to hang in there or people that still remain in his inner circle still today. I think, you know, it's about integrity and do you put the country above everything else or not? It's comes down to that. Absolutely. And we saw the same thing in the Nixon era where the tone is set at the top and people start to behave the same way as the leader behaves. And um, it doesn't go well. But before we run out of time, I've been listening to you on MSNBC talk about Ukraine and Russia and the unfounded, well, expected, because unlike Trump, we know how accurate our intelligence reports were and how predicted this was and how obvious it was from satellite photos. Uh, You could see the troops masked. Um, But so I want to talk a little bit about that. And I was particularly struck by something that Terry Savage, who is a nationally recognized expert on personal finance and the economy, the markets, but uh, even though she writes a personal finance syndicated column, she wrote something that for me captured sort of how I feel. And I want to read you just sort of part of it and ask you to talk a little bit. It says, the world is watching Ukraine be overwhelmed by a madman, millions of honest, hardworking people who want nothing but to preserve their democracy. Doesn't anyone read history anymore? Has the entire world forgotten the last time a madman tried to take over Europe? Back then, the world looked away, thought he would be satisfied with one slice of the continent. That was Hitler, 
a megalomaniac with intentions to control the world from Paris to Stalingrad, from London to New York, all while annihilating a huge swath of the population. Did you hear the echoes today when Putin reportedly said he would kill the families of the Ukrainian soldiers who did not surrender? So talk a little bit about what we could do, we as a country. I've posted a list of charities that we can contribute to that uh, a very dear friend of mine who's Ukrainian um, gave me that are vetted charities, and it's on my, it'll be on my website, but I've posted it on Twitter. But I'm also wondering, what can we pressure our government to do? Should someone be giving the same kind of missiles that are hitting Kiev to Ukraine so that they can fire back into Russia? What, what, what more can be done um, other than the economic sanctions? Yeah, I know. Fair question. And like, that was a very powerful uh, piece that she wrote because it, it's true. Um, and that is a, you know, Putin is a very dangerous uh, individual who he has no bounds or boundaries, right? That is who this personality is. Um, and when people say, well, what do you think he's going to do? <laughs> uh, I'll be very honest. And I said, well, you know, I look at him the same way I look at, at the, 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 through the same lens that I look at Trump because these are unpredictable people. Mm -hmm. And yeah. all you can hope is that someone in that inner circle can weigh in uh, because you're not going to control that individual. All you can do is hope that the, someone in the inner circle, which I know happened at times yeah. very directly firsthand with Trump that kept us out of, I can think of one person in particular that kept us out of, certain conflicts, military conflicts, where he was like yeah. able to talk him out of it and e even being a loyalist in that respect. But I think in terms of support for the Ukraine, I think, you know, backing them with the intelligence, um, our intelligence capabilities to help them um, in this scenario. And I think building alliances, I think, I, I think it's going a long way. I also think that, you know, I think it's been incredible to watch sort of the cyber community to come together to help, yeah. Uh, Ukraine and wait for that cyber attack to come from Russia. And I think that's something that we all should be really uh, prepared for. But honestly, I also think about the responsibility that we all have here as Americans and elected leaders in terms of backing our own president in this moment. And so I'm seeing a lot of attacks from the right. And I say this as a, as a re I guess I call myself a recovering Republican because I don't really I don't really have a home in the current Republican Party anymore, but I think that's not actually um, that's not actually a productive uh, thing to be doing when you're engaging and calling Biden weak and things like that because you're actually just you're you're siding with a foreign adversary yeah. at that point because we should really be united in our front as a country and it's being you know we're pro democracy we're going to have to defend Ukraine. We're united in this and we can have policy disagreements or whatever, but just going out there and taking cheap pot shots at, at Biden and, and also from some of these people who I think are now, you know, backtracking because the backlash they experienced, they realized perhaps they had gone a step too far in being pro Putin and pro Russia and trying to spread disinformation about what the reality was of the situation here, I think was a, a, maybe even a red line for them that they cross, but I think they realize that perhaps, you know, I never thought I'd see the day when a Republican would be rooting for, for Russia. I mean, wow. <laughs> Republicans have traditionally been so anti-Russia along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, that was all before Trump who has been yeah. the biggest supporter of Putin ever. And, um, uh, Hillary Clinton also wrote a very good piece in the Atlantic. And, uh, I'm going to post both the Terry Savage and the Hillary Clinton to our show notes so that our listeners or watchers, uh, viewers can read those. I think they're both very good. And um, before we run out of time, let me just ask a question about, because you've identified as a recovering Republican, and I, I for one, remember when the Republicans were people we dialogued with, where we could debate, we agreed on facts, we debated policies as a result of those facts. Now we have a fact-free Republican Party, um, not only fact-free, but lie-filled. Um, 
And I'm wondering, they don't even seem to have an agenda. It's other than stop the Democrats. They don't have an agenda. What what is going on with what is still called the Republican Party? And what hope is there that people like you who are thinking people who may have different views than I have on policy, but who I could have a conversation with you. We could debate what we should do on things because we both agree on facts. So what's the future for the Republican Party? And is there something, you know, some effort to make a party that you would feel comfortable joining? Yeah. Um, Look, I, you know, I don't, I think the Republican Party's current platform is disinformation and Mm -hmm. lies and the grift is real. Um, It's, you know, it's a party of grievances. And um, any division that they can exploit among Americans, that's what they do. They exploit it. And unfortunately, as we look at what's happening with Russia, I mean, we're actually enabling our foreign adversaries uh, to play in our own backyard by uh, supporting that division, right? And whether it's in our social media space or kind of they're playing along with these grievances because this is what they want. This is actually the best case scenario for foreign adversaries who are watching this happen to America because it makes their job so much easier to see what's happening here in this space. Um, And so, you know, the disinformation that's happening in terms of the undermining of our democracy and our elections, and also just, it's, it's a party of like hateful rhetoric now, right? I mean, um, and I just, I don't see a path forward right now, as long as Trumpism as I refer to it, I guess, has a hold in terms of that because they have decided that that is who they're going to rally around and cater to. And it's either someone like Trump or someone Trump-like, which really worries me for the future, which is what worries me about this this midterm cycle of elections because I do think that it is somewhat going to, it's going to play a big role in what happens in 2024 and laying the groundwork for that. And, you know, in terms of that, I think I don't have a problem saying like, I am willing to vote for moderate Democrat. And I think Republicans really, like me, who are moderates or people in the center, need to really work together. I mean, it's got to be the coalition of the willing here to counter these extremists. Uh, We're no longer in the party of like, you know, oh, you know, no matter what, I can't bring myself to vote for someone that has a D next to them because it's got to have an R. And even though this guy is a complete nut job, or we're going to end up with a bunch of Marjorie Taylor Greens in Congress who don't even have no idea actually of history or what's happening in the country. Um, They just do things out of, you know, because they, they fundraise off of it, right? It is the grip is basically what it is. In the seconds that we have left, I'd love to ask you about um, the Renew America movement, which is a movement that you're a part of. You're working with other Trump administration officials or former Trump administration officials, elected officials to make sure that we don't end up having more Marjorie Taylor Greens in Congress, more Donald Trump's as president. Um, can you talk a little bit about that movement and what our audience can do to perhaps help support that movement or make sure that we don't elect more of those, um, I guess, insane Republicans to office? Sure. Um, you know, I think it's really important to be uh, to be cross-partisan right now at this time. Uh, you know, I, I think that we are, we're a center-right leaning organization who understands Uh, where we are in terms of our democracy, in terms of what's happening here, in terms of the national level, and honestly, at the state and local level. And so I think we're, we're hoping to really galvanize um, the middle here and Mm -hmm. come together and push back on some of these races. You know, there's a lot of moderate Democrats out there that have Trump endorsed candidates running against them, Mm -hmm. who are principled people, who are governing, who are focused on actually doing stuff for their communities. And there's some you know, Republicans out there who voted, uh, who took a stand and who did the right thing, who are being constantly attacked. And that includes the Liz Cheney's of the world, right, who are out there every day, who are being, who are very conservative, true conservatives, right, who are being ousted uh, and attacked by their own party. And so that's, that's where we hope to kind of remain in the space and really kind of be a, be a movement there um, that is supporting uh both sides of the house in a manner that helps us kind of build this, this sort of network of people um, to really just kind of push back on what's happening here, because there's a lot of them running. And, um, you know, and when I see these ads as a, as a Homeland Security and national security person who spent most of my career, every ad is like, you know, guns, 
that's the one thing that's everywhere, right? It, it, oh, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah, guns and Jesus. And I'm like, how does that even add up? Guns and Jesus. So you want violence, but I mean, I don't even, it doesn't square with me, right? And I think that's, wow. that's really, I mean, at the end of the day, Americans want to have a stable environment and, and be safe in their communities. And when you have rhetoric like that, I think that sets the stage for what these people will be like should they get elected. Well, Victor and I certainly are hoping that Renew America is going to have some impact, and we will also post um, on our show notes a link to that so that people can learn more about what you're doing. Uh, Maybe one last question, because this has been so depressing as I think about feeling like I live in 1939 Germany and that this is happening here. But um, you were on 60 Minutes this week, uh, or a week or two ago, um, talking about Havana syndrome, which you have unfortunately experienced. And so if you could maybe say something about what Havana syndrome is and whether there's a cure, is it still a threat? What do you think the cause is? Um, just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. This is a, uh, you know, it's something that, that's obviously very personal and it, it has impacted more people than I think uh, Americans really know about or understand. And it is happening both overseas um, and it's happening here domestically. And I think that's why it's such a complicated issue because it's also scary, right? To really, when you take, take a step back as a human being and think about that and think about the fact that we don't really know exactly what it is. We, you know, it could be, it, it seems like it's a directed energy source of some sort that is mm-hmm. being used uh, but that's targeting national security uh, people or diplomats at the highest levels. And it, it does seem that way. And whether this is a foreign adversary that's doing it on our own soil, I mean, there's guesses, you know, some people will say that it's, um, you know, it could be Russia. There's a lot of theories out there, I think, that the community is still grappling with. But I can tell you that in the time that I've come forward, I've heard from other victims and other people that I've actually served, other intelligence officers that I had no idea had been impacted who are very ill still today. And yeah. um, I think we've got to get to the bottom of this. And we've also got to, we've got to take this seriously and get these people care and really start to figure out what this means um, going forward, because this could be really debilitating to us on the battlefield, even especially if it's happening here around government institutions and at people's homes. Right. And it started, of course, in Havana, which is why it's called the Havana Syndrome. And then you are one of the first people, you and Miles Taylor, uh, who you already mentioned was also a guest on this show, um, had the experience of it from the White House and from your homes. So it's not just in overseas postings. It is a serious threat here in America. Um, So someone needs to be researching it and finding out how to counter it. Um, And I hope that you won't suffer any further symptoms um, that are debilitating. I I know some people have had horrendous headaches. What are some of the other symptoms that people who have worked in or near the White House or in overseas postings for the U.S. government might be experiencing that they ought to probably pay attention to? Yeah, you know, I've I've, I've had the headache, certainly. Um, You certainly, I can tell you that it's a feeling when it's happening that... Mm -hmm. It, it feels like nothing you've ever felt. And that is when you kind of process it because you, it, you know, um, and but you, you may not know what exactly is happening at the time. Like certainly that's what happened to me um, where I got the pounding on the right side of my head and got disoriented and got dizzy and um, actually almost fell down the white house West exec stairs. But um, mm. it was certainly something like I'd never felt before. And I, you know, I didn't know you, you think the worst when it's happening Right, you think you know, I'm having a stroke. I mean, that's a normal yeah. reaction that I think a yeah. lot of the victims have felt. But a lot of these people, um, you know, there's people out there that that are can no longer speak. They're going <gasps> through speech therapy. There's people who have lost their eyesight. Um, this is um, this is a very serious thing that yeah. impacts people. And these are, I will say, some of the stars, uh, star intelligence officers or wow. military people. Um, the higher echelon of people 
that have clearly, for some reason, been targeted one way or another um, who are suffering still today. Well, we thank you for sharing your story and raising awareness about this issue. And thank you so much for joining us, Olivia, today. This has been such a great conversation. And um, we'll have to have you back someday to ask you all our other questions. But this has been so great. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Olivia. It was really a fascinating conversation. And good luck to you in what you're doing now. Thank you. Jill, I love that conversation so much. Last night we had such a funny conversation on, um, you know, something that is that reveals our generational divide very well, Um, and it has something to do with Ukraine. I don't know if you want to explain maybe your time in Ukraine and um, what we talked about last night. It it was to me hysterical because as we were talking about what we would ask Olivia today, I said that I had worked in Ukraine at a time when it was quite poor and that artists there did not have the equipment to do you know, paintings on canvas. So they used whatever discarded objects they could, and I bought and still have a wonderful painting um, in sort of a primitive um, Ukrainian style that is painted on a 78 record. And what did you say to me? Well, I know what a record is, but not a 78 record. Um. (laughs) And I laughed hysterically because, of course, you don't know what a 78 is. They haven't existed for a long time. So I explained to you what a 78 was, uh, 78 revolutions per minute on a vinyl pressed record that you played on a turntable with a handle that had a needle that picked up the sound and explained what a 45 was, um, 78s being more for classical Mm -hmm. music. And um, I remembered back to when I worked at the Chicago Public Schools, when at the beginning of the school year, a memo came out from the administration to teachers saying, here are some things that you shouldn't say in the classroom, one of which was, don't say you sound like a broken record because nobody knows what a record is anymore. And of course, you didn't know what that meant. And it meant when a record got broken, it would just keep repeating, 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 repeating. And so if you're saying the same thing over and over again, it's you sound like like a broken broken record. record. But yeah, because this is an intergenerational podcast, it is one of those things where sometimes we use things that don't communicate to the other generation. So Mm -hmm. I'm glad that we had this opportunity to have that conversation. But our conversation today with Olivia was really amazing. Um, She really established her credentials for the jobs that she's had and for the insights that she is now offering in how threatening Donald Trump is to democracy and to everything that we hold dear in this country. And I hope that our audience will spread this particular episode. Uh, Please retweet it, repost it on Facebook, tell your friends to listen or watch, because there's a lot to be learned from this, as well as from her, um, she mentioned the episode with Miles Taylor, Mm -hmm. and we also talked a little bit about the Chris Miller episode. Um, We are trying to be um, bipartisan and having guests from all perspectives, not just from the different generations, but from different perspectives. And I hope our audience will learn from these and see what they need to do in terms of protecting democracy, both here and, of course, our hearts and minds are with Ukraine today, hoping that the news remains good, that there is some diplomatic solution, and that we can stop the horrendous killing and the horror of the pictures uh, that we are seeing coming out of Ukraine. Absolutely. And it should be a courageous call for all of us to do what we can to try to help and support them. Um, So we thank you for listening to this episode. And like Jill said, hopefully you'll share this wide and far with your networks. um, And tune in next week for another episode of iGen Politics, wherever you follow your podcasts. Leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And because we're on YouTube, you can also subscribe to us, leave a comment, like us, and um, get notifications for the next time that we post. So thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next week for another episode.